Welcome to Current Affairs. My name is Nathan Robinson. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Current Affairs Magazine. I am joined today by Christopher Rufo. He is a Senior Fellow at the Manhattan Institute and the author of the book America's Cultural Revolution, How the Radical Left Conquered Everything. He is considered the intellectual architect of the conservative movement's campaign against critical race theory in schools. His words have found their way into speeches by Republican governors and senators, and he has helped craft legislation to combat the spread of what he sees as a pernicious leftist ideology. Recently, having been appointed by Governor Ron DeSantis to the Board of Trustees of New College of Florida in Sarasota, he has been explicit about his goal of reducing the number and influence of left-wing professors and restoring a classical great books education. His efforts in that direction have already led the Foundation for Individual Rights and in Education to accuse him of, quote, retaliating against faculty for First Amendment protected expression. He joins us today to discuss all this. Welcome, Christopher Rufo. It's great to be with you. Let me just lay out for you first kind of where I uh, come from on this. Uh, your book is about how the radical left conquered everything. Obviously, you can't literally mean everything. We clearly haven't fully conquered HarperCollins books or the Manhattan Institute, but I consider myself a, a member of the uh, radical left. I've uh, been working within it for a few years now. I wrote a book called Why You Should Be a Socialist. Um, and it strikes me, my impression has been that the left in this country is very weak. And um, I'll give you some examples. The leftists that I know are trying to do things like uh, raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour, deal with the Climate crisis, scale down fossil fuel use, it's boiling outside here, uh, protect uh, women's rights to an abortion, which your uh, guy Ron DeSantis is trying to do away with, um, parental leave, um, Medicare for all, making sure everyone uh, doesn't have to fear going bankrupt for going to the doctor, improving teacher wages, giving Amazon workers bathroom breaks, and of course, uh, that, uh, that nebulous concept, racial equity, trying to make sure you know black kids get the same level of schooling as white kids, closing the wealth gap, and stopping black people from being roughed up by the police. And so I've had guest after guest after guest on this program from the left, and, and that's the sort of stuff they've talked about. And they certainly, uh, in, to my impression, haven't conquered too much of it yet, yet. So when I read this whole, the radical left has conquered everything, I, I just, um, it sounds fairly delusional to me. So I don't even, it, it's interesting to me to even have try and have a conversation about this because the things you're talking about in this book are so far from the things that, um, I and I, I think my leftist colleagues think uh, truly matter in the world. So perhaps you could, we could start by you convince me that I'm wrong and that the things that I just listed have in fact been achieved. Yeah, yeah correct. Well, yeah, le absolutely. Let me enlighten you. And so um, you have to read the subtitle in light of the title. So the title is America's Cultural Revolution, How the Radical Left Conquered Everything. Of course, everything is a bit uh, cheeky, provocative, polemical a strategic mm. use of hyperbole and rhetoric, obviously. Mm. So not true. You know, they haven't conquered uh, my office here. Um, but, but, but you have to read the subtitle in light of the title. And so, well, why is it America's cultural revolution rather than, for example, as, as you might want, America's socialist revolution? Um, because uh, after World War II, um, and then f starting in the late 1960s and accelerating to the present, and I think you and I would likely actually agree on this, um, the socialist left, the more uh, orthodox Marxist left, even, let's say, that wants to have uh, a classless society that or in the kind of lowering of ambition wants to have many of these structural economic changes uh, that you've described just now um, has not succeeded. Uh, I'm, I'd be in 100 percent agreement uh, and very thankful for that, um, uh, because uh, the, 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 the if, if that were to happen, we'd have a very different country in many worse ways. I think the, the intentions yeah. would be... Amazon works to get bathroom breaks. But, but you have to know that it's a cultural revolution. And so specifically, you're looking at the institutions uh, and the culture of institutions. So the culture of, uh, of CRT in graduate schools of education or K-12 through classrooms uh, or the DEI departments that are now in 100 of the top Fortune 100 companies. Even, even to the point of uh, you know, some of these ideas have been appropriated and redeployed as 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 marketing messages for brand campaigns. And so when when I say the radical left has conquered everything, I, I mean, you don't mean that I, I'm very thankful that it's not the orthodox yeah. or the old left. But but let's be honest. I mean, I, and I think that it's probably a frustration that you have is the the kind of 
the, the real driving force of the left has given up on a Marxist or even a socialist uh, economy and that kind of structural vision. There's no appetite for that in this country. And I'm afraid that you and your colleagues who, who, who want that are really a remnant, not just of the broader political culture, but even a remnant of the left um, uh, and, and certainly not the subject or not the key interest that I, that I describe in the book. Yeah, I mean, it just strikes me that your book is highly misleading. You know, I was part of, uh, you know, I was a supporter of the Bernie Sanders campaign in 2016 and 2020. Right now, there are sort of, uh, you know, we've got writers on strike. Right now, there's sort of controversies over uh, whether people in the heat, uh, you know, Greg Abbott in Texas just uh, prohibited cities from restricting employers from making workers work in the heat. And to me, the leftists that I know, they're sort of working on these, these material things. I, uh, so when you say... You don't say you don't make that clear distinction throughout the book. In fact, you say the left throughout the left is doing this. The left is doing that. The left, 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 left. Um, you know, have the goal of the left is to destroy all Western institutions. And and I think to myself, but hang on a minute. Well, I, I don't think I say that. Where, where 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 do I say that? I don't say that exactly. And and has the goal of the left actually been the destruction of every Western institution? I guess you'd say no to your own question. D did I write that? I, I'm I'm unaware. Maybe you found something that I that I don't have immediately present, but. I, I don't think that that's the case that I make in the book exactly, and I also don't think that um, uh, that that is really a fair representation. The left, of course, can be described in many things. You just you define it one way, um, but I think in, embedded in the context of the book, the arguments of the book, um, all, all of the research and evidence marshaled in the book, um, I think it's very clear what fraction or faction of the left uh, that I'm referring to. And so, if you've read it and felt like, well, that's not me. Um, well, you know, it, it's not, it's not about you. Um, it's about <laughs> other people and other ideas. Okay. Um, and I think any, any reader that takes an honest look will understand. I'm not saying a blanket statement or a universal statement. It's a very specific argument that I lay out. But it's universal statements. This book is an effort to understand the ideology that, uh, that drives the politics of the modern left. Um, That's right. And then and then I and then I opened you know the leading leftist magazine in the country, sort of Jacobin, and I I look at the headlines in Jacobin, and they're about things like the uh, the writers strike, or they're about the fact that you can't afford a one bedroom apartment, or a full time salary. But but would you say that Jacobin is representative of the, the uh, left? Would you say that Jacobin is the ideological force behind the the, the kind of largest movements of the left? I don't think so. I don't think that. It's the leading radical left magazine in the country. I think they got a higher circulation than yeah. any leftist publication. Uh, I don't know about that. I mean, so why leave all? Why not leave that entire thing out of out of your story? Leaving what Jacobin magazine? Leaving, I mean, leaving issues like unionization, leaving issues like housing. Uh, leaving issues like you know the, the sunrise movement and climate change, uh, giving leaving the the movement for Medicare for all, abortion rights. The book is not about climate change. You, you can critique the book, but you can't say, well, you, you you should have written a book about all of these other issues. I mean, uh, the the subject in the book. Uh, but you're writing a book about the left. And. And what is your argument that I should write about the left uh, uh, in in the frame of all the issues that that you like, and but not the ones that I'm focusing on? Yeah. Then if you're writing about the left in institutions, then you should represent it accurately. No, I I, I mean I think that uh, sure. I mean maybe I'll write another book and include some of those issues, but an accurate one. But 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 you're you're saying basically that the issue selection that I've done to describe America's cultural revolution doesn't include climate change. I mean, it's it's a bit uh, I, I mean, I think it's a bit a bit odd. I mean, if climate change is irrelevant to the lineage, the ideology, uh, certainly the focus of the book is on uh, 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 the theory of revolution of the new left, the theory of racial revolution beginning with Black Panther Party and going to, to, to BLM. The theory of 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 Mark, neo Marxist pedagogy, starting with Paulo Freire and going to the teachers unions, and then critical race theory, and so climate change. I mean, you know, it's like plenty of people have written about climate change. You could you could read Mark, you could read Mike Schellenberger, a friend of mine, on climate change. But yeah, I have. He lies about it a lot. This has nothing to do with climate change. It's like pull a rabbit out of your hat. You know, uh, you know. <laughs> I think you think that this is more ridiculous than I do because I, 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 you strike me as a man who just doesn't talk to many leftists. 
That's not true. I mean, yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I, I that's the, the, the climate crisis is like the leading thing that every leftist that I know is, is sort of concerned about because it's so, so pressing and people are collapsing and dying in the heat. <laughs> and then, and then you're talking about like, you know, oh, diversity programs. <laughs> but the book is about critical race theory and diversity programs. Like, the young people in the Sunrise Movement, man. The Sunrise Movement. That's like the Zoomers. That's all they care about is like their future on a warming planet. The Sunrise Movement is some sort of some sort of astroturf where they deploy kids to get people feeling guilty and try to manipulate them into talking about the weather. It's like, dude. Talking about the weather? It's the hottest. The thing. weather, traditionally. Traditionally. If you're talking about the weather, it's something that you do in polite company because you don't want to talk about something more controversial and more interesting. Oh, yeah, how's the weather? So the left has turned the conversation about the weather. I mean, come on. Let's talk about the book. Oh, man. Oh, man. Go outside, man. Oh, man, it's the hottest year we've ever had. Global warming is getting worse every year. People, a lot of people are going to die. No? Okay. All right. Let me let me ask you this. You you say that a I want to ask you about this term nihilism that you use. You say a new nihilism is beginning to surround the common citizen. You use that you know, term a couple of times in your introduction. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Sure. So by nihilism, what what I mean by that, and if you specifically look at the ideologies that I outline in the book, and then you follow them to their practical consequences, and you actually read the literature from that late 70s period, and then you trace the, the, the kind of descendants of those ideas. Um, what you find over and over is that they deploy only the negative side of what they think of as the revolutionary dialectic. And so they're unable to, and, and they do this very self-consciously, to, to move beyond just the most abstract utopian vision. We're going to get to a, a society that is... Um, you know, uh, that, that is that is a utopia, that is where these problems are solved, where we've transcended uh, the limitations of human nature, where we've embedded the revolution into our biology. That's the kind of language you see. But then you actually look at the practical outcomes um, of, let's say, even tracing it forward to BLM. You know, what did BLM achieve? It achieved record high homicide rates uh, in black communities. Um, uh, it, it, and it, 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 you know, restricted or, or, or reduced police presence in, in, in some of the poorest uh, inner city neighborhoods, leading to an increase in crime and violence targeted towards the people who they were supposed to help. And so in every case, there is a utopianism that it then goes through a process of disillusionment. And the practical outcome is death and destruction and 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 ultimately ending in a kind of nihilism because they're committed to that negative side of the dialectic but they can never actually create any substantive alternatives um, that actually lead to a, a flourishing of human beings, a set, a, an actual implementation of greater justice. And so um, it becomes really a, a kind of ego-driven thing. All that's left is the ego. And so you see like Black Lives Matter is, is cynical, certainly. These people raised you know, hundreds of millions of dollars across many entities. They looted these organizations, they disappeared to their mansions, and they've left the people they were supposed to help in worse, real, tangible, material, social, political, and, and, and criminal justice uh, conditions than ever. It, it, and that, to me, is just re really a textbook form of nihilism. All that lacks is the ego and the image um, where, where the actual human consequences are, are, yeah. are, are quite, quite dark. I find it a weird term to use because I, I mean, I, I find that the people that uh, that I talk to in Black Lives Matter and related movements are, you know, not not only pretty idealistic, but have pretty clear things that they want to do. The movement for Black Lives has a long agenda list, you know, things like they, you know, they want to end the death penalty. That's pretty concrete. Or they want various, you know, alternatives to incarcerating young people um, or they want to demilitarize um, law enforcement agencies. And then when I, you know, pick up, you know, a, a book like uh, Ibram Kendi's book, I don't see, you know, darkness. I see, you know, he ends it, you know, with, um, he says, believe in the possibility, you know, believe that we can uh, strive to transform our societies to eliminate uh, racist policies. Racist, racist policies aren't in indestructible. Inequities aren't inevitable. Racist ideas aren't natural. 
but but that's a yeah. perfect example that that's a perfect example of the process that, that's a perfect example of what i'm saying yeah ibram kendi says we want to have have a society that is totally uh, has transcended from racism and that sounds great i i, I agree in, in in the very abstract sense that's that's a, a noble goal but you think we've already achieved it but then when you actually have ibram kendi when you nail him down on specifics well how what do you want to what what should we do to get there uh uh, uh henry rogers aka ibram x kendi um he says, well, what we need is a federal department of anti-racism that can deploy uh, positive discrimination against disfavored groups, that can restrict the speech of anything that is deemed racist speech, so ob obliterating the First Amendment, um, obliterating the 14th Amendment, uh, and then having a bureaucracy with plenary power over American society to re-engineer uh, everyone's speech, thought, behavior, employment, economy, et cetera, in order to achieve you know, Dr. Kennedy's goals. And, and, and of course, that sounds a lot like any of the other, uh, uh, you know, revolutions of the 20th century that ended with bureaucratic tyranny. And, and even Herbert Marcuse, the philosopher at the heart of the book, was smart enough and honest enough to admit that the Soviet Union, even he wrote this in the 1950s, I mean, uh, uh, to his credit, was a, was a perversion of that utopian ideal and had ended in catastrophic human carnage, uh, bureaucratic tyranny, and was not an example for the left. And so, so, so when, when people revive these ideas and, and, and say, trans, trans kind of transpose them into a, a racial language and say, well, you know, it didn't work out in the last hundred years, but maybe if we do it to have an anti-racist kind of total state that administers society towards this utopia, maybe then it will work out. And I, I just find that so, uh, so, so ignorant, you know, uh, uh, ignorant of, of, of history, ignorant of human nature and, 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 and really designed, and, and my last point, I'll, I'll try to make it brief to give you a chance to respond, but my last point is, and ultimately, what is it? Ultimately, I think it's a brand building exercise for people like Ibram Kendi to rack up speaking fees, to go on the DEI circuit, um, but, but they have really nothing tangible to offer. And I, I think even from your point of view, I, I would feel if I were still, as I once was, part of that old school, you know, so, more socialist left, um, I would feel outraged and betrayed by these leaders. The critical race theorists have nothing to offer poor black families in housing projects in places like Memphis, Tennessee. They have everything to offer their peers in elite academic institutions where they trade status, they trade prestige, they trade you know speaking gigs. But it's all it's all it's all it's all it's all a play. It's all an act. It, it, it's not. I think the uh, the critique that academics and intellectuals are somewhat useless is one that I would certainly accept. The critique that uh, the social justice movement is building a Soviet style dystopia that can be justly compared with the Maoist cultural revolution where the rivers ran with human bodies strikes me as so ludicrous as to be almost impossible for a rational mind to entertain. Oh, I'm, I'm not um, saying that it's happening. I'm saying that Ibram Kendi's policy proposal is akin to that, and that that's undeniable. You just read read the, read this text. I mean, what is our country without the Fourteenth Amendment and the First Amendment? I think Ibram Kendi believes in affirmative action, but I don't think he believes in in shooting distance. <laughs> I think that's crazy. Um, but and in fact, when I look in your book at some of the examples of what you think the you know the, the real outrages are. Um, you, you, you know, you kind of list things that are, you know, that you believe capture this contemporary insanity. And I'll, I'll just quote from you here. You have a list of the dystopian things that the, you know, the National Endowment for the Arts and National Endowment for the Humanities under the pernicious influence of Kendi and such have, have done. And they said that they funded, for example, a speaking series on race, reconciliation and transformation, a National Black Writers Conference on reconstructing the master narrative. An artist in residency program for racial equity, a leadership certificate program in diversity, equity, inclusion, an art exhibit on race, gender, and globalization, an overseas research program that aims to dismantle hierarchies of race and civilization, a biography exploiting the black power movement, a dance theater trilogy on race, culture, and identity, and a stage play for a manifesto on race through the eyes of a black girl recovering from self-hate. And I actually looked up what that stage play was, and the summary is, 
Margaret uproots her life, including her dead-end job and fizzling relationship after finding out she's unexpectedly expecting. She finds support and humor from her sassy and sharp Aunt Sylvia and her new friendship with Carolina, a pregnant cleaning lady at her office. This is by Breach. Breach is a smart comedy about friendship, motherhood, and family, and tackles the mother of all challenges, learning to love yourself. Um, you, you know, this stuff doesn't really leave me thinking that Western civilization is in peril and that the people you're talking about are in fact going to establish this totalitarian equity regime. Well, 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 well that of course, uh, in context, is merely an example of the capture of the cultural institutions such as the NEA. He was fine. That really just fund exclusively left-wing agitprop. Uh, I think it's a huge waste of money. Agitprop, I don't make the, the play uh, about Aunt Sylvia and Margaret? Yeah, I mean, I mean, it's not exactly Flaubert. It, it's not exactly, uh, you know, Twain. I mean, well, because they're not white. This is uh, this is the kind of mass-produced kind of schlock. schlock. No, not because of that. Because uh, listen to the plot. I mean, learning to love herself. It's like a proceeding. It's all breach. It's like self-help literature that is funded by the government. I think the government should not be in the interest of a kind of left-wing coded self-help literature. That's a total waste of money. It's not a totalitarian overreach. I don't make that argument at all. You're, 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 you're imposing that on it. But it's merely to list the examples of the kind of projects that get funded. We're not making great art anymore in the United States. Certainly not uh, making great art that's uh, subsidized by the federal bureaucracy. And, and it's an example of uh, taking something that, again, the creation of great art is a noble impulse, and then reducing it to just a political agitprop function for, for a... For I got to say... I, I don't know how you know that Breach isn't good art. The fact that you say, oh, it's not Twain, it's not Flaubert, I mean... You making the case that it is? Because it's, it's, it it's about, you know, black women? Like, what? Wait, you didn't know? Have you seen no, the play? No, come what on. You, you, like you don't even it? believe that. That, that. You don't even believe that. Well, I don't understand what your what your standard is. Do you believe that it's great art? Do you, do you, uh, hold on. Do you, do, you, do you believe that this is on the, on the caliber of a Flaubert? Uh, you know, tell tell me. I haven't seen it, Chris. Okay, so so you think that it might be though? Of course it might be. What? Of course it might be. I haven't seen it. Okay, well you should you should watch it. You should check it out. You could discover the next the next Flaubert. You know. Let's. One of the things that I think is, you know, struck me about your book is, but you spend a lot of time talking about these, you know, these radical theorists. Here's who they are. Here is the influence they've had, and then you say, you know, we need a we need a counter revolution against these people. Um, and I, it struck me that I would have liked to see more evidence that they were wrong, because um, a lot of the times when you cite something that you say some crazy critical race theory thing. Um, I find my reaction to be, well, you know, it sounds, sounds like they kind of have a point. For example, you say, uh, National Credit Union Administration told uh, employees America was founded on white supremacy. Critical race theorists argue that America was founded on racism, slavery, and white supremacy. Derek Bell, he said, uh, attacked Thomas Jefferson and George Washington as racist hypocrites. Um, but, but they were. <laughs> it was. It was founded on racism. They were racist hypocrites. <laughs> No, no, no. The United States was not founded on racism. I think that that is a total misunderstanding of history. Well, how many founding fathers were black? Say one more time. I couldn't hear you. How many founding fathers were black? Oh, so you think uh, you're re well, how, how many um, how many people in the Chinese Politburo are, are European? I mean, it's like uh, the, the representation well, fact. Look, not look, a hold big on. class of European slaves in China. But if there was, it would be a racist yeah. state. That's that's true. But look, if you say, what was the United States founded on? It's a very specific question, and I'll answer the question for you. The United States was founded on a vision of human nature, of natural rights, of equality and liberty. That excluded Black people. And of course, uh, was there also simultaneous slavery? Yes. Is that, uh, is that um, hypocritical? Uh, looking backwards, of course it is. But these are all people who were born into that system that was a human universal. Wasn't it a human? Black people didn't think they were unequal. And they established principles that were then uh, established, the, established the standard towards which the United States moved. And so um, it, it, the question is not, 
uh, are, are we, you know, um, better people than the American founders uh, uh, on these issues? The question is, uh, have we moved the world towards greater uh, liberty and equality? That's your question. Uh, and, and if you compare it back to, to what they did, they moved, they moved the, entire, uh, uh, the, the entire human civilization toward the, the principles of liberty and equality. My question is, aren't the critical race theorists correct that the founding fathers were racist hypocrites? They did more to move the human civilization toward liberty and equality than anyone else. And so to, to, to reverse impose that they were racist, uh, to take our conceptions of that term, it is so is so lazy. It's but it's true. It's no, it's fact. That's a fact. It's so it's so uh, it's so That's untruthful. Um, Come on, and, and, and you it's, don't you don't believe that Thomas Jefferson was a racist? It's not. It's not true. Yeah, it, it, it's such a lazy reduction. Do, do you think that you? The uh, do you want me to quote him? No, I think that's a totally unfair way to looking at it. I think that you have to look at it in the, the context of their own historical period. You have to look at them in the context of their own historical period. And I would say that Thomas Jefferson did more for equality. Except for black people. Than about anyone else uh, in, in the history of the world. But not for black people. No. Look at Lincoln. What did Lincoln we're, say? We're Lincoln, Lincoln said we're that Thomas, Thomas Jefferson, Jefferson. Thomas, hold on. I, hold on. Lincoln, Lincoln. It, would you, do you think Lincoln is racist? Let's just get that out of the way first. I think Lincoln had prejudices, but you know, Frederick Douglass was a big admirer of Lincoln. Lincoln was, you know, a person who had prejudices. I don't think that we need. To, I don't think we need yeah. the authority of Frederick Douglass to recognize that Lincoln, uh, in, to, to adopt some of the terms you might like, was an anti-racist president. I mean, Lincoln did more for racial equality than just about anyone. And I don't need to. I don't need to, to, to delegate. And I don't need to delegate the authority to, to Frederick Douglass, although it's helpful as a, as a the point. convenient way to duck the question about the Frederick Douglass. No, 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 no. I'm 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 getting there. Let, let me finish. So, what did Lincoln say? Lincoln said that Jefferson set the silver frame of of the Declaration of Independence for the golden apple of racial equality. But he was also a racist. And so, so, and so, so, and so, so Lincoln who I think has a much better understanding of these issues uh, intellectually, but also just, just in his own human experience, that what he went through and what he did, recognized that Jefferson was a tragic figure because of the- Because of his racism. Necessities of history that, that hemmed him in, that hemmed him in uh, at the time. Not hemmed in. Nothing stopped him releasing his slaves. But that he, that he, that he, that he put- that he put the silver frame. That he silver put, frame. put the right. that he set the st highest standard. Yes. That sounds very nice. That allowed then Lincoln. That allowed then Lincoln to achieve uh, the next step uh, uh, in the process towards that golden apple. And so, well, I mean, you know, he could have achieved it himself if he hadn't enslaved people. So I think to go back and say, oh, they're all racist. It's it's just so lazy. And I think that it. But it's true. It's just a fact. It's not lazy. It's just a true fact. And I think it. You know, and I'm going to tell you why. And I'm going to tell you what I really think it is. I think it comes from a sense of our own inferiority as modern people, um, oh, does it? especially uh, on the left. It's very easy to tear down a statue of Washington, Lincoln, Jefferson, and to say, oh, these people were bad. But if we're actually truthful, I think it's because those people make a lot of these left-wing activists feel so small, so insignificant, and so underwhelming. I think it's a sense of inferiority. They revolt against the great figures I would say people are genuinely upset by slavery. Who did more for racial equality than, than these BLM activists will ever do. And, 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 and that is, a, a, I think, a position that, if you look at it honestly, is incontrovertible. Well, I think it's insane. <laughs> I mean, I think Jefferson was very explicit that he, that he You're said- You're free to it. I mean, so who did, who's, who's done, uh, hold on, who's done more for racial equality? Abraham Lincoln or Black Lives Matter? Who's, who did more for racial equality? Abraham Lincoln or Black Lives Matter? You tell me. I, I would agree that I don't think Black Lives Matter has achieved its political goals. No, no, but, but answer the question. Who did more for racial equality, Abraham Lincoln or Black Lives Matter? The consequences of the, of, of free, of, of the Emancipation Proclamation are pretty much unparalleled in United States history. So and you would fact, agree with me that Abraham me Lincoln the did more for United racial States equality than BLM? The greatest it's United a yes States or no president? question. I'd probably say Lincoln and Roosevelt. You know, again... I think that all of this is an effort to not acknowledge the plain fact that this country was founded by people who held black people in chains and thought they were inferior. 
I, I acknowledge that. That's a fact. That's a historical fact. I, I, I don't see what, how, how anyone would deny that. But you said they weren't racist, and now you say it's a historical fact. No, no, you, you made two different claims. One is claimed that they, that they, they had chattel slavery, and, and some of the founding fathers, uh, many owned slaves. Yes, that's obviously evil. That's abominable. And they thought um, black people were inferior. But to say that they're racist is a different claim because you're taking a, 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 an, an ideological term and then back Good. imposing it on them in order to discredit, in order to discredit their work uh, advancing equality. And so I think that I reject it in, in a linguistic frame while acknowledging the factual basis that there was slavery. The blacks are inferior to the whites in the endowments of both body and mind. That's Jefferson. Is that not racist? Yeah, I think that that's, a, I, I disagree with that statement. I mean, I don't know what you want to say. I want you to say it's racist. I want you to, say, I want you to tell the truth. Um, but, but saying, okay, we're going to cherry pick one, 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 one sentence. No, I, I want you to tell the truth about this man. Oh, well, here's a question for you. I'll, I'll, I'll turn it back on you. Do you think Jefferson... Is, do you think Jefferson held slaves and it's abominable and I, of course, reject it. But do you think Jefferson um, advanced the cause of racial equality or did not advance the cause of racial no. equality? No, I don't think he advanced the cause of racial equality. I don't think that at all. Uh, Frederick Douglass would disagree with you. And I thought you've delegated your, 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 your moral intuitions to Douglass. Douglas said Jefferson, D Douglas was, was, a, was quite a fan. Martin Luther King was also quite a fan. Um, I don't think Jefferson advanced the cause of racial equality. I think he could have if he'd freed his slaves, but he didn't. In fact, he, you know, uh, entered into a very questionable sexual relationship with one. Well, but, hold on, because mm -hmm. Frederick Douglass and Martin Luther King were great admirers of Jefferson. You're telling me that you have a better... Look, I mean, I admire the Declaration of Independence, but I don't think, I think it would be absurd to say that uh, Jefferson advanced racial inequality. He was, the man was a racist and it's a shame. Um, and it doesn't, it doesn't mean that there's nothing uh, positive in his writing, but he was even told at the time. I mean, Benjamin Banneker, uh, you know, a free black man wrote to him and said, you know, how can you keep my brothers in bondage while I, you know, and write these stirring words about, about liberty? And, and Jefferson just didn't reply because he was. Oh, I, I think that's, I, and I agree with that a hundred percent. I mean, the, the, the contradiction is absolutely there. But what I'm asking you, though, is a, a different question. And, and Frederick Douglass, Martin Luther King, many other scholars, um, uh, uh, modern scholars would say that ultimately Jefferson is a tragic and flawed figure for those reasons that you outlined, obviously. But ultimately, his legacy as a human being in his life and in his work was to set a framework for the, for the allowance of racial equality. And, and that he, and he moved the nation and the world, in fact, towards racial equality, despite those things, despite his own personal conduct, despite his flaws, despite his hypocrisies even. And, and, and so I would say that- I think people's legacies are very, very complicated. And I think that actually, I think that one of the reasons that we now acknowledge that Jefferson's legacy is so complicated, we didn't really before, until the 1960s where these, you know, the, the people that you detest, the critical race theorists, we're pointing out all of the ugly dark side of American history that uh, really was not taught in the schools. And, you know, I, I've heard you mention that, you know, you grew up in California where you were taught all the dark side of American history because progressives put it in the curriculum. I grew up in Florida. I went to Florida high schools and I still got the classic, you know, uh, America's the greatest country in the world. Look at how wonderful we've been through all of history. Uh, and so I actually think that these radical scholars that, again, you really dislike, have, have made contributions to making the legacy of the supposedly great men of genius uh, more complicated than it would have otherwise been. Yeah, I, I mean, um, sure, I, I guess I can I can agree with you on that. Seems like a pretty, pretty solid uh, idea right. that it's it's. So let's teach some critical race theory in school. But, uh, you know, uh, you know, certainly history is complex, but you have to also understand what is the purpose of education. And then you also have to make decisions about what's in the curriculum in kindergarten through graduate school. And in graduate school, of course, like let's have, uh, uh, you know, let's have all sorts of competing ideas. Let's take mainstream ideas, radical ideas. Let's let's take them apart. Let's debate them. Let's work on them. But 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 what's happening is that the the kind of radical pessimistic view of of, of America's history has become the sole view in so many curriculum documents. America is presented not as a complex country that has been fraught uh, across many issues, but ultimately, I think, uh, moved towards these, these high ideals. But America is fundamentally racist. America is exploitative. You know, European Americans, white Americans are, are, are oppressors uh, because of their ancestry and because of their racial essence. 
that stuff is bad. And I think that even you would agree that teaching, teaching history just in that way is bad for kids. It's bad for the country. Um, yes. If that, if that was what was happening, I, I, and to the extent that it is, I certainly disagree. I think where we, where we just, where we disagree is whether this is an accurate characterization of what is taught. And also, I think ultimately, you have a fundamentally different view of the country than um, the people you criticize. I, I, and I think I, I, I want to get to, I want to identify um, some of the differences because I, I, you said recently on the Counterpoints podcast, you, you know, uh, Ryan Grimm played your clip of Tim Scott saying that racism and policing is a problem and that he'd experienced it himself. And you, you replied and you, you basically said, you know, that's not true. You said, I don't think racism is a strong and powerful force in our society. It has been in the past, um, but I dispute the factual basis of Senator Scott's speech. You cited uh, the Roland Fryer study, said, and you said that police do not show any disparate treatment of African Americans or other minorities. Senator Scott is doing a disservice with this narrative. So, I mean, you don't really think racism actually is very significant in the United States. I don't think that today racism is a significant and driving force in America's institutional life. I mean, I, I, I just no. I don't see it. I don't think that that is correct. And even well, you wouldn't. You, see know, it, you, you see data points to the contrary all the time. For example, some of like Yelp. For I saw this it, it kind of a, in some ways a trivial example, but I think it's it's a good way to understanding attitudes and behavior. Yelp decided to use a tag um, black owned business to tag black owned businesses on their platform, um, so people could have that information as they're searching, and they found that. The businesses that were tagged as black owned businesses experienced a huge and, and significant increase um, uh, uh, in, in, in web traffic and actual foot traffic. And so, um, you know, if Americans were on average, uh, you know, extremely racist, they would see this and they'd be in the privacy of their own browser and they would say, oh, I don't want to patronize this business. But actually, the opposite is true. I think Americans uh, in general, of course, not all Americans, there's always going to be prejudice and bigotry, et cetera. But um, Americans are good hearted people. They strive to treat everyone equally and all things equal. They try to help groups that have been, of course, historically discriminated against, such as African-Americans as, as, the, as, the, as the important example. And I think institutionally, you know, I always ask people, okay, well, systemic racism, what is it? How do you measure it? And give me some examples. And they go into these long, you know, statistical studies that demonstrate disparities. Okay, fine. There's some disparities. But what is the what is the causal mechanism? How do you measure it? How do you reduce it to systemic racism? Systemic racism is like it, it's kind of like a, a a a an abstract concept that has emotional and rhetorical power. But when you actually try to give it social scientific scrutiny, it kind of dissipates and disappears. There's other explanations, of course. Um, but 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 again, I, I just I, I do not think that the United States, the major institutions of the United States, are animated and driven by racism. That's not true. I think you know that's not true. If we look at, for example, um, you cited the, the Roland Fryer study, which you said was one of the best studies. Um, I mean, they did, they put in some, some pretty sophisticated controls to try and find out, you know, are black people in fact treated differently by the police? And they found, and this is quite controversial, that in terms of um, shootings, black people are not treated like these. But when you said the police don't show any disparate treatment for African Americans, actually, that's misrepresenting the study because they said the opposite. They said that on every kind of non lethal use of force, uh, slapping people, pushing them into walls or onto the ground, handcuffing them without an arrest, drawing a weapon or using a pepper, or pepper spray, there are racial differences, sometimes quite large, in police use of force, even after accounting for a large set of controls designed to account for important contextual and behavioral sure. facts. Yeah, and, and so your explanation is that, therefore, the, 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 the explanation for that is because the police are racist? Is that what you're claiming? Yeah, the police who might think of themselves as being completely fair might have biases where they tend to be more likely to rough up a young black man to throw him against the hood of a car. Have, have you spent a lot of time with police officers as they're doing their job and they're in the, in, as they're in the line of duty? I've spent some time with police officers and I know you have too. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And, 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 and that's why I say that. And so I think that again, the, the actual, the, the, the real experience is quite important. And so I've spent a lot of time embedded with police officers 
you know, some are great. Some are, are not as great. Obviously, it's like any profession. You know, there, there's good ones and bad ones. I'd say mostly very professional, very good. I've also spent a lot of time in, in, in poor neighborhoods from all, all different racial backgrounds, including three years in a public housing project in Memphis, Tennessee. And, and you know, the actual experience of police officers in those communities is materially quite different than, than you know, in a kind of majority white suburban area. And I think that uh, you, you could say that there's a, there's a kind of level of, of, of physical aggression is the argument that you're making that is different perhaps in these kinds of communities. But there's many other explanations for why that might be the case besides, well, you know, all the police are racist, you know, defund the police. And I think that one of the most important questions is, do you think that there are racial disparities in, 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 in criminality, meaning the commissioning of crimes or frequency of committing crimes? Yeah, but this is what, what, what sophisticated social scientists like Fryer do is they try and control for differences in crime, differences in encounter, and say, given a particular encounter with police, are police more likely to use force? And that's what they found. Now, I just want to say, the, the people who, you, you say that, you know, the police, you talk about what well, your exposure to the police, what they, you know, they all think of themselves as great, they're very professional, whatever. Um, the people who disagree with you are the majority of Black Americans in public opinion polls, because, you know, nearly 90% of Black adults say that Black adults are treated less fairly than whites in the criminal punishment system. A, um, a minority of white people, but a majority of black people say that black people are treated worse in stores, banks, job applications by landlords. Um, you know, nearly a third of black Americans have said that they experienced unfair treatment by police within the past year. And there are huge gaps in black, between black confidence in the police and white confidence in the police. And so it seems to me like maybe the experience of black people with police is a little different from your own. When you poll Black Americans, they have pretty low confidence. And you're saying that they're kind of delusional about that. I, I didn't say that. Well, they must be. I think there is a vested social interest in improving those numbers. I think it's yeah. really important to have a good relationship between the police and, and, and the communities uh, where they work, you know, of all different racial backgrounds. And as you say, I, you know, I, I don't know the specific numbers, but they sound about right uh, uh, in, in other materials I've read. And certainly that is something that we should improve. But then the question becomes, yeah. okay, well, what do we do about it? And BLM and, and the radical left offered a solution in 2020 that was followed by a number of police departments. Well, we need de-policing. Uh, we need to defund the police. We need the police to pull back. And what we've seen is then a great yeah. paradox. And this is evidence in the social science literature. My colleague, Heather McDonald has written extensively about this. You have this problem of trust, which I concede to your point, I agree, is a problem. Well, you didn't agree when you saw Tim Scott. You said he's making it up. No, no, I said perceptions of trust, different than the actual material measurements of behavior. Oh, okay, so they're wrong. But perceptions of trust. So they're wrong that they have they've been unfair. But the question is, well, what do you do about it? Do you, do you actually have proactive policing? Do you have broken window style policing? Do you have community policing? That actually has officers on foot patrol making relationships? That's the kind of law enforcement that I support. Um, and I think that it can improve those those perceptions and attitudes. But the, the left says decarceration, de-policing, defund the police. Well, and, and police oversight, you know, making sure that complaints are actually dealt with. P push the police back. And we've seen and we've seen. And again, Roland Fryer has done this. Heather McDonald has done this and other a number of other scholars. Anytime you say, OK, well, you want less police presence in your in those communities. Those communities see skyrocketing rates of violence and especially homicide. So that's a that's a conundrum, and 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 that is a conundrum, and, and that's a big social science problem. It seems to me like when you say that race, you know, that race really does not matter anymore. We still see statistics on maternal mortality, or mortality on these experiences with police, the kinds of schools people go to, whether people uh, families can afford to send kids to college, the wealth gap, rates of cancer, whether you inherit a house. Uh, you know, whether you're likely to get an apartment application accepted, and these vary by race. Uh, it, it seems to be very strange to say, to, you know, as you do, that, you know, Tim Scott's perceptions of, of the facts are wrong, and that actually racism is a thing of the past. Well, you, you said at the beginning of your thing to, to, that I'm arguing that race doesn't matter. Of course, I'm not arguing that. I haven't said that. I said that race is not a causal mm -hmm. determining force in American life. It doesn't animate American institutions. Um, I think that is absolutely true. Um, uh, hundred percent true. But racial inequalities are very real. Of course. And I've actually written, you know, for example, even a policy paper uh, for Heritage Foundation, 
um, why I believe that policies associated with critical race theory would actually have actually ended up deepening racial inequalities and will continue to do so in the future. And in fact, they ignore the most important variables, which are the background variables, um, which are the more uh, rigorous explanatory variables. People like Robert Rector and others have, have done this work. And so I, I, I reject this idea that any disparity is, is automatically uh, evidence of, of, of racism or systemic racism as an animating force in American life. And the solution to those disparities is to, to do DEI training and seek to reduce that. Um, there's no evidence that that's true. If you take, for example, the wealth gap, it's been it's existed uh, continuously since uh, the time of slavery. Yeah, of course. And I think that the wealth gap is absolutely uh, part of the historical legacy of racism. Uh, and you and I would agree on that question. But but it's a separate question from is racism the driving and animating force behind American policy today? Those are different questions that get conflated by people on 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 the left side of the spectrum in order to make a rhetorical point that is not actually a solid historical, social scientific, and, and, and logical point. Um, and, well, and, and so, as, so long, as long as we can both agree that the racial wealth gap is, is severe, causes a, you know, the existence of a certain kind of white privilege, if you will, and ought to be redressed, um, then I think we would be on the same page. But I suspect you wouldn't, uh, in fact, uh, put it that way. I, I really have to get to the laws uh, on a critical race theory that you have helped uh, write. Um, you know, you, you have said that these, these laws essentially just uh, prohibit, um, you know, making uh, essentialist statements uh, about people on the basis of, uh, and they vary obviously from state to state. Yes. Um, I, I want to give you an example of a statement and, and you can tell me whether you think it, it ought to be, uh, it, it sort of crosses the, the line here. Um, if, if I were to say um, whites are not putting in enough effort to re-educate themselves out of, out of racial ignorance and white people believe they have so little to learn and racism is a way of life for the vast majority of white Americans, um, uh, the disease of racism permeates a whole body politic um, why, uh, is, why does white America delude itself and how does it rationalize the evil that it retains? Uh, I assume that would be a pretty clear cut violation. Well, I, I mean, I think first and foremost that that's a, a false statement. I, I think that it is factually untrue. I think it's a, a kind of political agitprop statement. And in my view, um, uh, K through 12 public schools, the curriculum and the values that they transmit should be determined by the people through their elected legislators. Uh, through their school boards, um, uh, through their, the, their representatives and the, through the political process. And I think that we have an abiding interest in restricting false, uh, inflammatory, uh, race essentialism and scapegoating, no matter who it's directed against. And so as such, I think that, that I, would, I, would, I would say that the public is well within its right uh, to, to say that, you know, you know, whiteness is not a disease that has infected the body politic. I think that's the kind of rhetoric that should be out of the public schools. Well, that was Martin Luther King. So uh, we can agree that he shouldn't be taught in schools. <laughs> no, it's saying you are saying, should that be advanced as the ideology of the public schools? So he could he could he could come give a speech in, in a school and say that if you have that statement and then you're saying, hey, this is the statement of Martin Luther King. This is a statement of someone else. Is that the official policy of the school? It should not be. Um, but if it's in the context of teaching a history lesson, he, he couldn't he couldn't come and give a speech and say that if it's in the context of teaching a history lesson, um, it can be something that is subjected to rigorous debate. I disagree with that. What if the teacher says I agree with Martin Luther King? Say one more time. If the teacher says I agree with Martin Luther King. That's part of a debate. And that's a teacher's personal opinion. Obviously, a teacher is entitled to his, his or her opinion. Well, they get fired. It's not much of a debate if they get fired. Uh, but, but what we're saying is something that's quite different and, 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 and quite a, a different point altogether. You're saying that should a teacher advance this idea is very different than should a teacher teach it in a historical context as a statement made by an important historical figure. Yeah, but the teacher's going to be terrified that they're that they advancing ideas by discussing them. No, that's like that's like also saying the, the previous statement that you made. You made a statement that Jefferson said uh, that that uh, the black race is something I can't remember the exact words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Inferior in body and mind. Can you teach? Can you teach that as the official position of the public school? Of course not. I would reject that. I would say that should be opposed. You shouldn't teach that as the official policy. But can you teach it in the context of, hey, Jefferson said this. Let's take a look at it. Of course you can. And so 
you're, 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 you're trying to make a rhetorical point by conflating the official position of a school, the kind of values that it's advancing, and the historical comments or statements of relevant figures that can then be subject to analysis within a curriculum. Then just to close, and just to conclude here, the correct position. It's clever. I'll give you that. It's clever, but 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 it but the correct the correct position here. Then the correct position here is that critical race theory should be taught in schools, but neutrally, and kids should be taught critical thinking and critical evaluation of critical race theory. Should they be taught critical race theory in schools in the sense of the discipline of critical race theory, or in the sense of the pedagogy of critical race theory? Get, assign a Derek Bell story and then ask them to discuss it. Yeah, I would have actually no problem uh, with that. I mean, I've, I've read all of Derek Bell's work. I would have no problem in, let's say, a college classroom if Derek Bell is part of the curriculum and is subject to debate. Uh, uh, maybe in high school you could have something. But again, th there's no restriction in any state on including that Martin Luther King quote, on including a quotation from Derek Bell. The restriction is simply that you cannot uh, advance, inculcate, or indoctrinate students into believing, for example, that one race is inherently superior to another, that one race is inherently defective. And so, so you're trying to bring in an example, uh, uh, and then, but, but, but you're not reading the law right, uh, uh, and you're not reading the actual, uh, 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 the actual classroom practice. Well, we'll find out if I'm reading the law by, by what happens to teachers, and we'll be monitoring that because a lot of teachers have said, because Do a it. lot of teachers have said Do it. that they feel incapable of teaching even things like Brian Stevens's Just Mercy. So we will see if this, in fact, does do what you said and have a very small impact or if it has a very large impact. We'll find out, won't we? And I would like to and I would I would propose to you this. And I, I would agree that that's a good experiment. Take that Jefferson quote. Take that Martin Luther King quote. Team up with some teachers in Florida. Teach it in a public school. See what happens. I, I think that if they teach it in a way that 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 uh, that that doesn't advance it as their official position, um, but actually uses it as part of a robust historical discussion. Uh, they'd be well within the law, and I think uh, I think that they would be applauded uh, and certainly not restricted. We shall find out. I myself am going to go back to worrying about the issues that I care about, such as, as I said, climate change, minimum wage, union organizing, etc. cetera. Uh, Christopher Rifo, if, thank you for joining us on Current Affairs. If people want to pick up the book and read it, it is America's Cultural Revolution. It is available from Broadside Books. Thank you so much.